for this morning's uh, or, or today's symposium. I had the uh, privilege of <laughs> working uh, with Dr. Neville as his limb preservation uh, and wound care fellow uh, at the Nova Healthcare System in, in Fairfax, Virginia, where he spent an entire year telling me uh, that I did not remind him at all of his best fellow that he has ever trained, uh, a man by the name of Nivin Singh. So Dr. Neville has a very extensive biography that you can check out on the symposium app. I will not go through all of his accomplishments or accolades because that will take uh, the entire morning. However, I will tell you that the secret to his success lies not just in his remarkable uh, clinical and uh, surgical abilities, uh, but also in his tremendous ability to build bridges and connect with people at a very fundamental level. Uh, his approach to problem solving and consensus building uh, is unwaveringly warm and positive. See, he's right next to me right now. Um, and I invite you to experience that firsthand uh, at some point today. Uh, Dr. Neville understood <clears throat> decades ago uh, that limb preservation work is by necessity interdisciplinary, collaborative, and uh, sometimes difficult. However, to quote the uh, famous Notre Dame coach, Frank Leahy, uh, there are no shortcuts in life, uh, only those that we imagine. And Dr. Neville has lived this mantra uh, for most of his professional career. Uh, so Dr. Neville, thank you very much, sir, for uh, talking to us today about the uh, multidisciplinary approach uh, in, in creating the preservation teams. So anytime you mention Frank Lee, you have to say go Irish, so I have to say go Irish. But anyways, I want to thank you so very much, uh, and Mr. Chairman. What a fabulous uh, symposium. I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. So when I told people that I was coming up to give this lecture back home, they all said to me, oh, you're going to see Dr. Casey? I said, yes, I will. Every single one of them said, bring him back with you. <laughs> so I'm just going to put the, you know, the government, the, the officials have left, but I'm going to put them on notice. I'm going to try to steal them away and bring him, bring him back to the D.C. area. But really, thank you very much, I mean, for, for inviting me. So let's go ahead and get started. So let's talk about the multidisciplinary approach to uh, limb preservation. So let's talk a little bit about the past, what we are doing in the present, and what I think the future may hold. So in the past, when I first started at Georgetown, it was Chris Attinger, who was a plastic surgeon, and I, and we sat in the surgical lounge together and discovered that we were sharing the same patients. And we tracked our patients through the system and found that they had to come to see us 8.8 .8 times back and forth before they ever got any definitive therapy. And so we said to each other, well, why don't we start seeing patients together? So we went to the administration and said, we've got this great idea. We're going to start seeing these patients together. We're going to streamline their care, make it better for them, better for you. And they said, okay, very nice. Have a nice day. Go away. <laughs> and it took us 15 years to finally convince everyone that this was something worth doing. So that, that occurred, but I don't have 15 years any longer. So then I moved to George Washington University, which you can see here. George Washington University was a little bit of a different situation. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit of a different uh, milieu and makeup. So that was a different approach to the problem. And now I've moved to the ANOVA system. I hope this is my last move. I was recruited to ANOVA. And that's also a different uh, situation. So my, my message to you this morning, the, the primary message to you this morning, is all politics is local. So last night we had a wonderful uh, session, a dinner evening session. I heard great comments from around Canada about people's particular experiences around the country. And I, it, was, it struck me that even in Canada, all politics is local. And every situation is a little bit different. So when I give this talk at other locations, and I'm going to show you our sort of cookie cutter approach and what I think the ideal uh, makeup is of a limb preservation program, but my really my message to you today is all politics is local. Work with the situation where you are. Find people that are truly interested in this topic and just start. Just do it, and then you can build the program around you. So that I think that's the most important comment I would actually have for the. So we all know there's a need. I don't have to uh, show this audience this particular slide and belabor this too much, uh, but limb preservation and amputation costs our system $20 billion a year in the United States. The inpatient stay is actually longer than myocardial infarction and stroke. So this is a huge problem, and diabetes is exploding around the world. I mean, truly rapidly exploding. So that we're all gonna have uh, job security. There's not gonna be any need to worry about that. And then when someone does have an amputation, I think we can certainly tell our healthcare system that it's not just the amputation. It affects their mortality, it affects their further health care, there's a high incidence of contralateral amputation, so limb preservation truly is a worthy goal. And the mortality of these patients is not insignificant. 
The five-year mortality of someone with symptomatic peripheral arterial disease is much higher, as you can see, than many other well-publicized disease entities, which get a lot of funding, I would argue. And as a matter of fact, if you see this uh, on the right, uh, lower right-hand corner, after your incident diagnosis of critical limb ischemia, your mortality is higher than almost every disease entity except for lung cancer. So these patients are very ill, and we can impact not just their limb preservation, but also their life with appropriate care. And there's worldwide interest in this topic. So I was recently, or not recently, but about a couple years ago uh, in the Orient because they wanted to set up a similar program. Uh, and it was interesting, I was talking to Dr. Papia last night, and Dr. Papia had this actually the same comment. So when we first started our program, we called it the Limb Salvage Program. The Limb Salvage, Diabetic Limb Salvage was actually the, the name of one of our uh, symposiums and one of our meetings. But I went to dinner with uh, the, some of these uh, Chinese physicians, and they grabbed me and they said, you, you must change the name. And I said, why? You cannot call it a limb salvage program. And I said, why? Because in Mandarin, salvage is the same word as trash. <laughs> they said, the patients want to come. <laughs> and it's interesting, Dr. Papia last night had the same experience here yeah, in Canada. Right. I guess they made a change from salvage to preservation. So I compliment you on calling this a limb preservation. We all know that diabetes is exploding around the world. Uh, there's anticipated over 600 million people worldwide will have diabetes fairly shortly, costing the healthcare systems of the world a lot of money. Why is that? Well, we all know why that is. I thought this was the uh, middle picture is very interesting. This is a street in London. I'm walking down the street to give a talk in London. This is the American food store. What's in the American food store? Chips, candy, Cokes, ready-made meals. So we're, we are exporting our diabetes around the world. Sorry about that. Hmm? And we're going to hear a lot of good talks about this today. I won't belabor this, but there's many reasons that people get diabetic foot wounds. The only point I'll make here is about 50% of people require revascularization during the course of their diabetic foot care. So half do not, um, and half uh, just require good wound care, which we're going to hear a lot about today. I'm anxious to hear about that. But we really need to better identify, I think, those people that truly do need revascularization and do it in a more timely manner. In terms of diabetic vascular disease, the only point I'll make is there was a misconception in the past okay. that diabetic was a micro diabetic lower extremity disease was a microvascular disease, and this actually led people to say you could not revascularize people and you should just do an amputation. Um, this was based on some studies actually from the 1950s. This has actually been debunked. Their diabetics do not have core microvascular disease in their limb. They do have tibial artery disease. So here's an arteriogram on the right of a patient with significant tibial artery disease. You can put that arteriogram up and you can say, just tell right off, that's a diabetic patient. Um, and they do have a microangiopathy. They have medial sclerosis, calcification, platelet reactivity, and endothelial dysfunction. So they certainly do have some things in their vasculature that's abnormal but you can revascularize these patients and save the limb. It's not microvascular disease. So if I was gonna set up my ideal multidisciplinary limb preservation program, what would it look like? Well, before we construct it, what are our goals? What do we want to do? Well, certainly we need to raise awareness. And meetings like this, and, and you being participating, and I'm very impressed that the government is here today. We can't get, I was talking to Jeff Syracuse, we can't get the government to come to our meetings. We need to do that. So I was very impressed. But we certainly need to raise awareness of the problem, of what we can do, and I would argue the implications of the problem to the patient and to the healthcare system, especially in regards to patients with diabetes and renal failure. So in Washington, D.C., when we started our program, people would say, you don't really think you can save the limbs of patients on dialysis, do you? Well, we can. And you know, we're working with some of the dialysis companies now. Matter of fact, I'm working with Fresenius and uh, DeVita in their centers just to have, the, while the patients are on dialysis, just have the nurses take off their shoes. Just take off their shoes and look at their feet. Uh, if we can just get that done, I think it'll go a, a, a long ways towards raising awareness of limb salvage in the renal failure patient population. And as I said, we want to streamline their care. These patients don't get around well anyway, and so we need to make sure they can get ex uh, expedite their care nicely. It will serve as a referral source for the community. If you set up one of these programs, they will, people will come, patients will come. Either patients will find you, or doctors who don't want to deal with the situation will send them. So you can serve as a nice referral source for your community. And it's a great forum for education, both of physicians and patients. Uh, and research. It's a great form of research, as we were speaking last night. Uh, there's such a need for data in this area that it's very a fruitful area for further research. So here's the structure. Well, we'll go over that. We'll go through it a little bit piece by piece. Um, but does it work? Should we even do this? 
is, what we're, this, is this just a, are we spinning our wheels? But no, there actually is good data. Vicki Driver, a great podiatrist and from around the world, showed that if you do set up these programs, we were talking last night about programs in Italy. So if you do set up one of these programs, you certainly can reduce significantly the number of amputations. There's data we can point to to show that if you can construct one of these programs, they are effective. So what's the team going to look like? Well, to start with, it's your provider team. Um, and you have to, you need, uh, I would argue, some vascular physicians, uh, whether they're interventional radiology or vascular surgery or interventional cardiology. You need someone who's going to work on the blood supply. You need people that want to work on the soft tissue. The podiatry group is critical. Uh, plastic surgeons uh, may be useful in your center. And then you need all the other uh, adjunct uh, specialties that are they're very, so very important. Infectious disease is critical. Oftentimes nephrology, cardiology, endocrinology. Uh, we call it the blue plate special, the blue plate special concept. So if we've got a limb patient in, we get the blue plate special and they get all the, many of those uh, consultations. But the key, as I emphasized earlier, are physician champions. So here's Dr. Singh and Dr. Casey, the two best fellows we've ever been associated with. Um, uh, and you just need someone who's going to just take the bull by the horns and push this program forward. That's really the key, the key item of your provider team. I had to put in my obligatory raptors. So. <laughs> and the point of this slide is the team can be really good, but you got to pick the right team. You wouldn't want the guys on the right playing the game on the left. <laughs> Trust me, I've seen the guys on the right playing. No. <laughs> but so the, current, the team is really, really important. You have to fill it out with the right people. We were talking last night uh, about you know, people that are truly interested in this. When I got to the, the, the current situation where I am in Northern Virginia, there's a very large podiatric community. And uh, when Dr. Casey and I started our Zoom conference, it was he and I in the room together. We were talking to each other. Well, now, Ahmed, I'll tell you that the room is packed. We have the residents, uh, cardiology, radiology, rehab, podiatry. But it was interesting. Many of the podiatrists said they wanted to be involved. But then when they started to really see the kind of patients we were uh, acquiring and attracting, some of them did not want to, which is fine. But, and so the ones that wanted to stepped up. So you have to have the right team. You need good staff. This is the key. This is key. I mean, you know, you just need good support staff. We found that the ideal ratio is about one to three doctors to uh, to support staff. If you can attract that in your system, but you need a uh, nurse navigator, case managers. You need all these people. These patients require all this additional help. I think you need a space, and we're still looking for a space in our own particular institution where I'm now. We had one constructed at Georgetown, but it took me 15 years to get it. Um, and then when we went to George Washington, they gave it to us right away, but it was sort of a couple rooms in the back of the ER, which we took. Uh, and now we're looking for a space where I am, but I think you need some identifiable space. Um, it's interesting, where I am right now, there's already a very robust wound center system. There's four wound centers in our system. They were very concerned that we were going to try to take away all their patients, and I still I am massaging and telling them, we just want to help grow your business. And what I tell them is about 10 to 15 percent of the patients in those wound centers will eventually make their way to our complex limb preservation center. So we don't want all the wound patients. We want in this limb preservation complex with the multidisciplinary approach, about 10 to 15 percent of the patients in a standard wound center is the number that seems to be about right. Right now, they're not sending any of those. So, that, so that I think there's work to be done there. Um, and then you need all the other things, obviously, that come along with the program vascular lab systems, good imaging, good ability to do endovascular revascularization, a good operating room. We're just finally building a hybrid room. Dr. Casey uh, had to work in the, in the 18th century when it's with me. We didn't have a hybrid room, so <laughs> we were finally building a hybrid room. You need good vascular lab capability. We finally built out our vascular lab system. And the only thing I'll mention about this is we're still struggling a little bit with how to measure tissue perfusion. I don't know what you use here. I've used TCO2s. We've used skin perfusion pressures. We're going to start some work and some research with that uh, uh, the hyperspectral imaging camera, which you can see in the bottom. That's a, a, a device where you can actually take a picture of the foot. And using hyperspectral analysis, it can give you oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin measurements and it's actually fairly reflective of tissue perfusion. So we're still struggling with a good way to assess tissue perfusion to know should we put someone through revascularization? And after we've done that, have we done enough? Um, do we need to do more? Especially with the endovascular piece, sometimes we need to do more. So we're still struggling a little bit with this, but you need a good vascular lab in your system. 
you need good arterial imaging, I would argue. Um, CT angiography and MR angiography are getting better. I don't think they're ideal for our patients. Uh, they show you proximal arteries very well. Sometimes they struggle with the distal architecture of the foot. So we still do a fair amount of arteriography. Catheter-based arteriography, I think, is still very important for our patients. Um, you can use CO2 for the proximal arteries in patients that have kidney problems, but you still need good distal pedal architecture with catheter-based arteriography, I think, to really help plan some of these revascularizations and save these limbs. So we still do a fair amount of standard arteriography. And then you need all the, uh, the uh, things that are near and dear to my heart, the vascular reconstructions, uh, both endovascular and surgical. And uh, I think you know, this is a, 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 a paper by Phil Goodney on the left, and you can see the number of endovascular or catheter-based interventions has just skyrocketed, and the number of bypasses has dropped off a little bit as endovascular therapy has gotten more effective. And that's reflected in my practice. So I started out doing all bypasses, and now about 76% of what I do is endovascular. 25% is still surgical bypass as the first method of revascularization. Um, and I think about, for me, that's about where it's going to settle out. Some of my colleagues, I don't know about Dr. Syracuse from Boston, but some of my colleagues are up to 80, 90, 95%. Some people would say, always try endovascular first. Always try angioplasty first. I'm not sure that's exactly right. Although we certainly do do all the endovascular procedures, um, some more than others, I still think just standard angioplasty with or without stent is the best. Not a huge fan of atherectomy, not a huge fan of cryoplasty, not a huge fan of laser. After I worked on all these things when I was at the NIH back in the day, uh, and there's, we could discuss why, but uh, we just mostly do standard angioplasty with or without a stent. But we're getting more aggressive. So here is multi-vessel tibial angioplasty. You can see all the way down to the foot. You can see this patient had extensive tibial artery occlusive disease, and we were able, uh, you can see the arterium on the right, to open up a uh, tibial artery. So we're getting much more aggressive with some of these uh, endovascular interventions, but I still think you have to have bypass in your practice. And we always try to use the vein if we can. We can splice vein and put it together if we need to. But uh, we often just use a prosthetic graft with our patch technique uh, when someone doesn't have a vein. This has been very helpful. This has allowed us to, I think, to save limbs that otherwise we would not have been able to revascularize and would have lost. Um, so this is who we bypass. We bypass people that you think actually are going to live a long time. So if someone's going to live more than a couple years, as evidenced by the basal trial from Europe, uh, if they have a reasonable life expectancy, you want to give them a durable result, which is sometimes a bypass more than angioplasty. If they have a large volume tissue loss, we reported some data that they may do better with a bypass to get more robust flow to the limb. If you have long, totally occluded arteries, um, it may be better with a bypass. Although you can see the slide just before, we did angioplasty on that patient, so we're getting more aggressive with that. <coughs> with that okay. if, and then if failed endovascular therapy. So we're actually looking at our bypasses now, that's one of the research projects we're working on, and about 40% of the bypasses we're performing now are performed in people that have had failed angioplasty or endovascular in the past. And these people don't have as good a result as if you had done bypass first. So here's my vein patch bypass, which we think is very, very useful. We just interpose a piece of vein between the prosthetic graft and the artery. Why do we do this, you might say? Well, there's biologic reasons and hemodynamic reasons, which is a whole separate lecture, um, that make the prosthetic graft work better, I would argue, to the small tibial arteries um, of the left. And you can see the picture on the right is the prosthetic, then you can see the patch, and then you can see the tibial artery. So this makes the graft work much better than if you took that prosthetic graft directly right to the tibial artery. We've reported our results, which are pretty good out to four years. And then along came a heparin bonded graft. So now one of the companies figured out how to put heparin on the inside of the graft. We compared those to our vein grafts, and as you can see, the red line is the vein graft, the black line is the heparin bonded. I still put the patch on it. So we use the patch with the heparin bond to graft, and it's pretty close to your own vein. Not as good. So if you come into me and you need a bypass and you've got a saphenous vein, I'm using your saphenous vein. If you've got a saphenous vein in the other leg, I'm using the saphenous vein in the other leg. But I'm no longer going to carve up your arm looking for arm vein. I'm no longer going to take a cadaveric vein off the shelf. I think those don't work hard at all. I hope they're not good. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do my vein patch with a heparin bond to graft, and I'm going to tell you that it's pretty close to your own vein, and there's a good chance that at four to five years, 50-50 chance it'll still be working, which is much better than a straight uh, prosthetic graft. 
So what do we do with these patients? You're going to see a lot of these patients come into your office. These are the patients with the so-called desert foot. I don't know how I got that name, but it's called the desert foot. There's just not many targets in the foot to try to revascularize. What do we do with this? Well, we're getting more aggressive with intervention. Uh, Dr. Monzi from Italy was the one that sort of championed this, and I'll never forget the first time I ever heard about this technique, I thought, what's that crazy Italian doing? I mean, he's putting balloons and things all around the bottom of the foot. I thought he was out of his mind. But it works sometimes. <laughs> it doesn't always work. So we're getting more uh, involved in this, and you can see the patient. There's the arteriogram on the left. The middle picture is our balloon all the way down to the plantar surface of the foot, uh, and you can establish flow uh, into the foot on some occasions. We also have an surgical option, though, so I can do my patch technique, but add a fistula at the anastomosis. We do that by actually combining the artery and the vein and putting the graft into the artery and the vein. Why would you do that, you say? When I first presented this data, everybody said, well, the blood's going the wrong way. It's going to go back up the vein to the heart. That's true, but what it does do is it reduces outflow resistance, so it keeps the graft open. It keeps the velocity in the graft because there's some flow into the vein above the critical thrombotic threshold of the graft. And then I would argue it all does also does something called deep venous arterialization, which is the hot topic right now. So in my world, the hot topic is deep venous arterialization. When we do this procedure, what I do is, I, it's hard to see, but what I do is when we attach the graft to the artery and the vein, I take a little device and I break the valves in the vein heading down towards the foot to try to get the blood to go through the vein into the capillary bed of the foot. So that's deep venous arterialization. And we used to think that would never work, but there's some data actually from Thailand and from Singapore that shows that it does. And so in very uh, dire situations, we're trying to get blood both into the venous system and also into the arterial system. And in these patients, we also had pretty good results in a group of folks that would have just been offered an amputation otherwise. There is a device coming that does this with a catheter approach. Uh, we're going to be involved in the first clinical trial to, to investigate this. So what this does is you put a catheter in the artery, you put a catheter in the vein, and then you can see in panel two, using ultrasound and a magnet, you try to get these to line up. And then in, in slide three, you have puncture between the artery and the vein. And then in slide four, you can see you put a little stent there and then put a device down that does what I do directly. It breaks the valves in the vein heading towards the foot, trying to establish blood flow from the artery into the vein to the foot. So we'll see. <laughs> We're just gonna start the trial. Um, there is some uh, data, as I said, from Singapore and from Mexico that it can be effective. We're going to see if this has an effect. But these are techniques that we try to offer to patients who really don't have any other options and they don't have a good target for bypass or angioplasty. And you're going to see these patients when you set up your centers. You will, they will find you. But the soft tissue care is an important piece beyond the revascularization. I don't have to tell this crowd that this is critical. Um, you have to, wherever you are, seek out people. So, so on the soft tissue side, you have to seek out vascular surgeons that want to do this kind of work long and hard and tough to do. And on the vascular surgery side, we have to seek out the soft tissue people that want to be involved because it can be long and hard and tough to do. So the soft tissue is as important as the revascular surgery. There's nothing more frustrating. And I still face this once in a while. There's nothing more frustrating. I, actually, before I came out here, I had to call someone on the phone and say, come on. I did this wonderful bypass on this patient, and I hear, oh, well, they're just going to do a BKA. I said, what? You know, do, no. I mean, you need something that's going to take your revascularization and do something with it to save the foot. And you have to offer all the types of amputations. Um, and I don't have to show this audience this slide. Other interesting things, so last week I was doing a, I was doing a baloney amputation. Um, and uh, one of the nurses stopped, it, stopped me and said, Dr. Neff, I said it. She said, I didn't know a EKA could be an elegant pursuit, which I thought was kind of interesting. I guess. Well, there's no more pieces in the room, but I guess she's used to the trauma PKA. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but a well done baloney amputation by whoever does it, if it's well done, uh, it can really augment that patient's rehabilitation. But sometimes the amputation is the right choice. There's no question about it. If the patient doesn't ambulate, they're demented, they can't cooperate with their therapy, significant tissue loss, there's no question that sometimes amputation is the right thing for patients. Uh, to get them. 
if you set up one of your centers, again, this is just a great format and forum for patient support and education. We've recently set up our amputee support group, which I think has been very nice. We started this in Georgetown, and now we've started it in the ANOVA system. It involves, uh, actually interesting, it involves um, long-term care people. It involves the, uh, the psychiatry department. We really are trying to put together a support group for patients that are going to have an amputation um, and educate patients and physicians in this regard. We're going to have our own meeting uh, in October. Everybody wants to come to D.C. in October. We'd love to have you come down. And then the final couple slides, I'll just say a couple words on research and then where I think we're headed. So again, this is a fruitful area for research. We're looking at some remote monitoring devices to look at both graphs and stents and, and flow. This is a very hot topic also, how we can remotely monitor patients so we can detect if their revascularizations are failing. We're also looking at remote monitoring of wounds so that uh, you can remotely monitor the wounds and not just say, we'll go to the ER and see how you see what's going on. So we're working on some devices that will allow us to remotely monitor size of wound and tissue characteristics, interesting. We'll be able to tell you how much is granulation, how much is the fibrous tissue. So there's some exciting things coming down the pipe. And then the final couple slides, we talked a little bit about this last night. We are very hungry for data in this realm. Uh, the buzzword in my healthcare system is big data. Everybody wants big data, quality outcomes. They don't. They don't care about my graph patency. They don't care if my graphs are patent or not. They just want to know about patient satisfaction and out quality value analysis and all these kind of things. And you can see the explosion in papers uh, regarding wound healing and wound management. Just really, the, the field is exploding. We've actually started the CLI Global Society to try to address some of these issues, especially with the government. And we've just already looked at some Medicare databases which show that our patients, uh, to show the government, our own government doesn't understand this. This is a, a mortal condition. We can really impact not just life, but limb as well. And also there's financial implications. So after someone has a diagnosis of critical limb ischemia, the next year their costs go up 30%, and the most expensive patient is the patient with gangrene to our healthcare system. So our government doesn't need to emphasize this data to them. So our last two slides, here's our current model. We were talking about this last night. Our current model, limb patient, they got a wound on their leg, they don't know where to go, where do they go? They go to the emergency room. When they get to the emergency room, they're told, go see this person, this person, this person, this person, and they get on what I call the limb freeway, which in Washington, D.C. is a mess. The freeway is a mess. You never get what you want to be. So that's what happens to our patients. And this is what we want to try to establish, a limb preservation model where there's one place to go, which, apropos to the comment we heard from your health minister this morning, which is focused not on the doctor, not on the hospital, but on the patient. So that's where I hope we're heading. I think it's meetings like this which will really push the field forward, and I congratulate the organizers and Dr. Casey on this topic, and look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you very much.